Good morning, everybody. Yes, as you can see, my talk is going to be about London and the Stewarts. Um, and it, it's really um, about some very specific incidents of interactions between members of the Steward royal family and the ship. And of course, for the second half of its life, the London was a royal warship of the Stuart dynasty. And as such, it would have borne the Stuart coat of arms at the stern, on the stern piece, very much like the one you can see there on my title slide, which was the one that adorned the stern of the Royal Charles, which Rebecca mentioned uh, just now, the ship that had brought Charles and the rest of the royal family back from exile in the Netherlands in 1660. Of course, then embarrassingly, the Royal Charles was in the Medway in 1667 in, during the, um, the notorious and disastrous raid that she described um, and was towed away. Um, and although she was eventually broken up, the Dutch kept the Stuart arms um, as a trophy and it hangs this day in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, where you can still go and see it. Um, and the Dutch are inordinately proud um, about the fact that it's, it's there. But it, it, it's a wonderful, evocative survival of the era, really. And as I say, something like very similar to that would have adorned the, the stern of the, uh, of the London. But I said that it was a Stuart warship bearing those arms for the second half of its life. The very different story in the first half, as we'll now go on to see, I hope. Yes, there we go. Because the first encounter between members of the Stuart Royal family and the London had them on completely different sides. As far as the Stuarts were concerned, when the London was built, it was an enemy. And the people who served in the London looked upon the Stuarts as an enemy. And of course, this is one of the contexts for why the ship existed. The regime in the 1650s, Cromwell's Republic, the Commonwealth, call it what you like, was very, very insecure. And it was building these grand new ships like the Royal Charles, the Naseby, as it was when it was launched, and the London to, as a deterrent, against potential invasion from France or Spain. And of course, they expected those powers to be supporting the Stuarts to launch an invasion for a restoration in England. And by 1658, Cromwell was actually allied to France and had been promised Dunkirk, which you can see there in the, the picture, uh, which at the time was under Spanish control, um, was under siege from the French, and Cromwell had sent 6,000 troops to support the French and a fleet. And there at the top of the screen, you can see the English fleet. I won't attempt my gruesomely bad French um, at this point, but one of those will be the London. And there it is lying off the coast of Dunkirk as part of the besieging forces. If you look to the right of the screen, to the right of Dunkirk and the fleet, you'll see two armies drawn up in line. And this represents the Battle of the Dunes in 1658. Now, there were 6,000 of Cromwell's Ironsides supporting the French. There were 2,000 Royalist troops on the other side in the Spanish army. And I always think this is much too little known that in some ways this was the last battle of the British Civil Wars and it wasn't in Britain at all. It was in modern day France in 1658 when the Royalists and the Roundheads were opposing each other in front of the walls of Dunkirk, commanding the Royalist contingent was Charles II's brother and heir, James, Duke of York, and along with him was his younger brother, the youngest of the three brothers who were then alive, Henry, Duke of Gloucester. So that would undoubtedly have been the first time that the Stuarts actually encountered the, the London um, itself. 
much happier times as far as the stewards were concerned were just around the corner. And here's the famous scene in May 1660 on the beach near The Hague when Charles II and the rest of his family go down to the beach. And if you look at the far right of the screen, you can see again, there's an English fleet lying offshore. But this time, of course, they are friends. They've come to take the royal family back to England with the restoration having taken place. The London was the second largest ship in this fleet, the Naseby being the, the largest. But of course, it, this is the point that they have sent the two most modern, most prestigious ships in the fleet to bring the royal family back. That is no coincidence. They, they are sending out um, a signal by doing that. Talking about sending out signals, of course, one of the first things that happens when the royal brothers get aboard their, what is now their fleet, the, the Royal Navy, as it has now become again, is that a lot of renamings take place. The Naseby is swiftly uh, renamed Royal Charles, as one would expect. Um, various other renamings take place. The London, of course, is one of the few ships that doesn't require renaming. Um, there might have been a bit, a bit of ambivalence about this, given how much London had supported Parliament during the Civil War and so forth. But on the other hand, Charles wants to send out nice touchy-feely signals to the City of London and more importantly to all the money in the City of London that from now on things are going to be absolutely fine um, between them. And so the London remains the London. She then, when they set sail, as Rebecca mentioned, James, Duke of York, is aboard the London for that cruise back. Hopefully dressed rather more modestly than he is here in this um, bizarre 1670s Baroque extravaganza by Henri Gascard. Um, and he would almost certainly have been flying from the uh, mas masthead of the, the London, the flag on the right, the flag of the Lord High Admiral, because James had been um, intended for the role of Lord High Admiral pretty much since birth. And now at last, with the stewards returning to England, he can actually enter properly into that office. And this is quite an interesting event, I think, in terms of um, naval history, British naval history. There's often an assumption that James and Charles are totally... Um, not really interested that these are just nice titles that they hold. Of course, the um, the question of members of the royal, royal family holding nice, honorary, prestigious titles or then being stripped of them um, and so forth is very much in the news at the moment. As Rebecca and Mark were saying just now, some things never actually change very much in uh, British history at all. Um, and of course, James, Duke of York has had a very bad press because he ultimately becomes King James II, um, this sort of allegedly notorious Catholic monarch who's then kicked out at the Glorious Revolution. So it, it's often difficult to get the perspective on James that he was actually an incredibly hardworking Lord High Admiral. He, was, he and Charles were really, really interested in their navy, deeply committed to it, and we can see that, for example, in something like this. I know you can't see the text very clearly, but this was a, a private notebook, a pocketbook, which James would have carried around with him. And what it contained is an incredible amount of detail on the ships in the fleet. You know, not just the guns they carried, the men they carried, but getting down to things like the dimensions of the timbers. These are very, very, you know, committed people in many respects. You may be able to see the name London up at the top left. That's actually the next but one London, because of course, as we know, all London, as it were, blows up in March 1665. 
it's then replaced by the loyal London, which is another casualty of the Dutch attack on the Medway in 1667, where it's burned and destroyed. So then another London is built soon after that. And that's the one which is referred to in this particular pocketbook of um, James's. Now, the next major interaction between if I can actually find my cursor, which seems to have disappeared completely, there it is, between the, um, the Stuarts and the, uh, the ship occurs in January 1661. And it's all very much to do with this lady, Henrietta Ann, the 16 year old youngest sister of Charles and James. Um, and despite the fact that she is only 16, um, she is already contracted in marriage to the gentleman um, in the portrait that she is so implausibly uh, displaying there, Philippe Duc d'Orléans, the brother of King Louis XIV of France. Um, if any of you saw the fairly recent TV series Versailles, then you'll have some ideas in your mind about Philippe Duc d'Orléans. Um, although he looks quite glamorous in this particular portrait, he is wearing men's clothing. This wasn't always the case. Uh, Philippe had some very um, strange tendencies, some, most of which were actually played down very considerably in, uh, in the TV series. Um, and he turned out to be quite a a disastrous husband, but I mean, that's all for the future um, in most respects. In January 1661, as I say, Henrietta is going to go aboard the, uh, the London to go over to France for her marriage to Philippe Duc d'Orléans. She doesn't go on her own because going with her, again, my cursor has disappeared, many apologies, is her mother, the Queen Mother. There she is on the left when she was quite young. That's how people tend to remember her from the great Van Dyck portraits of the reign of her husband, King Charles I, as this young, glamorous, and incidentally incredibly short queen. Um, but by this time, she's much more as she looked on the right um, as the, the Queen Mother um, of England. And she is going back across to, uh, to France, partly to chaperone her daughter, Henrietta, um, and partly to go back to live um, in France um, because she fairly quickly became completely disgusted with her son's court, with the nature of the restoration, with some of the things that Rebecca talked about early, early on. Um, so it was somewhat frosty. Um, and so they go to uh, Portsmouth which at the time looked roughly like this. The picture on the right is from about 30 years later, showing the dockyard. The, the diagram on the left um, shows the dockyard at top centre and then the fortifications of Portsmouth and Gosport um, more towards the middle of the diagram. And so they go down to Portsmouth at the beginning of, of January 1665 and the uh, the king uh, goes down with them to, to see them off, and they arrive there on the 5th of January. Now, in some respects, this is a very worrying time uh, for the, the Stuarts. Um, there's a rebellion in London virtually at exactly the same time, Venice Rebellion, which is led by a group of diehards um, loyal to the Commonwealth who haven't accepted uh, the restoration. So they've got that kind of security threat in the background. The other alarming element um, is, well, two alarming elements happen on the same day, really. Let me read you from um, the Journal of the Earl of Sandwich, who's in command of this particular ex expedition, what happens on the 9th of January, 1661. The ninth, Her Majesty and the Princess embarked in the London, the wind south southeast, and turning that wayward, the pilot stood too near the horse, which is a sandbank just outside Portsmouth Harbour. Little wind, very smooth water, 
They had several warnings from myself and other, and otherwise attack, but did not in time. So this ship touched in her tacking and the tide settings of the eastward bound her upon the sand. But it was a low water and soon as ever an anchor was got out, she came out without secondary damage through mercy. Um, so the London briefly runs aground. Embarrassing, but even worse is what's actually happening on the ship, possibly in the large stateroom, which Pepys went into in 1660 and, um, as Rebecca said earlier, commented on how big it was. Still the same diary entry the same day. About the same time, the princess being not well, we discovered that she had the measles. So it was resolved we should go for Portsmouth Harbour with a ship, which we did and arrived that day uh, very safe. So why is this particularly alarming? Well. In that period, of course, virtually anything caused serious health concern. But more importantly, since the restoration, which had only occurred in May 1660, in the autumn and winter of 1660, Charles II had lost two of his siblings, Henry Duke of Gloucester, who I mentioned earlier, and the other surviving sister, uh, Mary, the Princess of Orange, the mother of the prince who later becomes King William of Orange, um, King William III of, uh, of England. So clearly there is huge alarm about the health of Princess Henrietta there on the, the London, and she has to go ashore uh, with the Queen Mother, and for several days um, there's considerable concern, and obviously the whole voyage is in abeyance while they wait and see what happens. And on the 17th, again from the same journal, they let the princess blood, which made her very weak and continued so and feverish. Um, bleeding, of course, one of the two great um, cures of this period for absolutely anything, the other being leeches. Um, so they're bleeding poor Henrietta on that time. But finally, on the, the 25th, after about a fortnight of of a delay, um, I quote, the Queen and Princess embarked again, the Princess very weak. And so they do finally sail for France. They go to Le Havre, uh, they drop off the Princess and the Queen Mother, and then Sandwich, who's in command of the expedition, brings the London back um, at that particular point. So, At this point, of course, the London then goes out of service. She goes into um, what's called ordinary, namely a kind of reserve status. And if you look at this list, which is from September 1661, you can see the name of the London there. I've ringed it in red. And there she is at Chatham with the other large, mostly the other large ships, of Charles II's navy. It's a time of complete peace. There's no need to have these big ships um, out at sea. They cost a, a lot of money to fit out. And so they just lay them up with a, um, a very small um, skeleton crew of which more in a moment. Um, this continues if we go through to I think this is when, yeah, 16, May 1663. As you can see, there are even fewer ships at sea. The name of the London doesn't even feature on this one. But if you can compare these two side by side, on the one on the left, the one from uh, 1661, the number of ships at sea carries at almost 9,000 men. So it's still a fairly substantial force by the time of the one on the right in May 1663. The total number that's given on the right-hand column is only about 3,500. So it's a very, very small number of ships that are at, that are at sea in um, May of 1663, and the, they don't need the London at sea at this particular point. So where is she? We know she's in the Medway off Chatham, and here's a very, very crude representation of the Medway, if you know the Medway well, what's at the top right of the screen 
meant to be Rochester Cathedral and Castle. Um, and again, I mean, I don't quite know where, how that part of Kent has suddenly turned into the Highlands of Scotland, given the, uh, the height of the hills behind. So I don't think this particular artist has got a, a great sense of perspective, but it gives an idea of how these ships looked in ordinary during this period. And as I say, the London would have been uh, one of them laid up looking very much like, um, like that. Um, Pepys in the role as Clerk of the Acts of the Navy Board has to carry out periodic inspections of the dockyards and that includes um, inspections of the ships laid up in ordinary and so in July um, of 1663 he's down in Chatham and he goes aboard the London and this is what he finds I quote so to the London where neither officer nor anybody awake I boarded her and might have done what I would, and at last could find but three little boys, unquote. So the security clearly wasn't great. Um, and it's probably a miracle that actually any of these ships survived their times in ordinary at all, because clearly, you know, the, the, this was not um, a terribly tight, um, tight system, to, to, to say the least. And so there, there she remains. Um, right the way through until 1664. But by the summer of 1664, as Rebecca's already mentioned, tensions were rising markedly between England and the Netherlands. Um, you've got a propaganda war. And again, Rebecca alluded to the sort of insults that are being bandied around. And so things like the pamphlet <coughs> pardon me, on the left are coming out. Um, a catalogue of the demands, uh, of the damages rather, for which the English demand reparation from the United Netherlands, and so on and so forth. And there were plenty of similar pamphlets being printed on the Dutch side as well. So things are escalating, insults are being traded. Sir Robert Holmes is very active on the coast of Africa, taking out Dutch trading posts and really annoying the Dutch in that way. And of course, most famously, is that the small settlement in the picture on the right, New Amsterdam, is captured by the English in August, September 1664, um, and promptly renamed New York after, of course, James, Duke of York, who was one of the, uh, the sponsors, in effect, of the, the expedition. So things are escalating rapidly and markedly. And it's at this point that thought is given to expanding the fleet in home waters and putting into service ships like the London. And if we go now to this uh, fleet list on the left, there's the famous picture of the London incidentally on, on the right, much used uh, by the, the campaign and rightly so. Um, but if we look at the ship list on the left, which is from August 1664, you'll see that there up at the top of the right hand column is the name of the London. And if you actually look at the numbers, you can see that she is far and away the largest ship being fitted out for sea. Crew of 400, the next largest ship resolution has got um, a crew of 260. This, of course, is one of the reasons why they're so reluctant to put in the London and ships of a similar size into service when um, it's a period of complete peace, because obviously it is so expensive to pay a crew of that size, to supply a crew of that size, um, and so forth. But now, August 64, things are escalating. And notice, the London is the first of the really big royal warships that they are putting out that is are going to go into um, service at this particular stage. And so, it, as I say, I would, I would suggest that it's a sign of how important um, it is. Also, as a sign of how important it is, is the fact that when it does go out to sea, the man who's aboard her is again our old friend, Edward Montague, first Earl of Sandwich. 
who was incidentally originally the title was going to be Earl of Portsmouth. We have no idea why he changed the name to Sandwich, but there we go. Probably <coughs> just as well that he did, otherwise uh, he would have caused havoc with lunch times. Um, but Sandwich goes out in command of her. He's the Vice Admiral of England. He's the Master of the King's Wardrobe. He is a major player at the Stewart Court. And of course, we know this <clears throat> very much because he's such a key figure in Pepys's diary, uh, who is a distant relative of his. Now, not a lot happens, to be fair, in the time that Sandwich is aboard the London in the late part of the latter months of 1664 and then the very start of 1665, except one thing, which is that over December 64, January 65, there's this astonishing spectacle in the night sky, a comet known as the Great Comet. And Rebecca and Mark were talking earlier about omens and how the the destruction of the London could be seen as an omen. Well, we can actually take it back from that because this comet, as you can see from the title of this um, pamphlet down towards the bottom, um, it was seen itself as <coughs> a tremendous omen of what might happen. And given what does happen over the next few years, the loss of London, then the plague, then the great fire, then the Dutch and the Medway, it's not very difficult for people then to look back with hindsight and say that all of this was predicted by the great comet of 1664 to 65. And Sandwich aboard the London, just doing nothing more than cruising up and down the eastern half of the English Channel, going from the Downs off Dover down to Portsmouth and back again, in effect, um, he avidly observes this um, phenomenon. And we'll see this here, his journal was published. And on the right hand side, um, you can see <coughs> the sort of um, comments he's making on the, the comment. Um, you know, it's incredible level of technical detail. And again, we sometimes assume, as we did earlier talk about with James Duke of York, we sometimes think that these people um, don't have a great technical grasp and so on. I mean, after all, Montague was a landowner from Huntingdonshire. Um, what interest can he possibly have in astronomy and navigation? Well, I think those entries from his journal give you the answer. He's, he's incredibly interested and he's got this incredible command um, of what he's actually seeing there. And so that is where the, um, in a sense, the service of the London goes up to the point where Rebecca took it over. And there was the, the point where early in 65, Sandwich leaves her, she's then allocated to, to Lawson and is sent for this voyage down from the Medway to the Hope, and of course that's where the explosion um, occurs. And it's at that point that John Evelyn provides this um, epitaph for the ship um, from the his diary on the 9th of March, 1665, went to receive the poor burn <coughs> burned creatures that were saved out of the London frigate in which were blown up above 200 men by an accident, and so perished one of the bravest ships in Europe. One of the bravest ships in Europe. I think that's a very nice epitaph for it. But we're not finished with the omens quite yet. Because the diary entry of Evelyn for that day concludes with this. Returning this evening, I saw a pillar of light of a very strange colour and position, being to appearance upright from the body of the setting sun, seven or eight yards long and two foot broad. So there's yet another strange incident, another strange phenomenon 
yet another omen in effect that's linked to the destruction of the London. And as I said just now, given what happened subsequently with the much better known disasters of the Second Dutch War, I think it gives it quite a, uh, an odd supernatural context almost. And on that note, um, ladies and gentlemen, I shall finish with some blatant commercialism um, and thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, David. Perfect. The omen thing, is is that a un unique to the London? Are there other examples where something catastrophic happens and then society looks for the omen with hindsight? Oh, yeah. I mean, th th this is happening all, all the time. I mean, it's, um, you know, th throughout this, this period and on into the uh, the 18th century it becomes less common from then on but and of course this is a long tradition going way way back to you know pre-christianity in, in effect this um, reading of omens into um into incidents like this so yeah ab absolutely i mean um, i'm trying to think of um another 16th 17th century example off the top of my head but i mean th there are plenty um it, it's very very much seen to be a thing that um, you know pe people are still looking for in, in a sense that uh, if a disaster takes place well what are the reasons for the disaster yeah uh, Liz Gifford points out lots of references in Shakespeare's plays oh yes oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love the idea that we'd be putting cheese and ham and butter on our Portsmouth not on our sandwich <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it is a very, very bizarre concept. As I say, there's no no reason I've ever seen as to why it's changed at the last minute. It is changed, as I say, obviously, because there's, uh, there's still an Earl of Sandwich to this day and uh, very proud of his connection to the snack as well. <laughs> uh, Robert asks, did the different naval ports have different purposes where at the time was and where at the time was the home of the English Navy? Well, there's no one home as such. I mean, Chatham is the biggest dockyard by a long way. And that's where most of the ships are laid up because the Medway is such a, a big enclosed protected space. So they, they thought it was protected until, of course, um, 1667 when the, um, the Dutch come along. Um, Portsmouth um, has, is, has, a, has got a similar role. Um, Deptford and Woolwich are smaller and are more oriented towards building um, than the other two, but I mean, all four yards build ships, all four yards repair um, and refit ships, so th there isn't a kind of a specialisation as such, it's just that Chatham um, is the largest. Um, obviously as well, there's an issue of geography here, Portsmouth is further away, it's easier for peeps and Charles II and James and so forth to get to Deptford, Woolwich and to an extent Chatham than to Portsmouth. Portsmouth is more out on a limb really but um, so why no. did why did Henrietta go from Portsmouth then? Shortest route to La Havre. Oh, okay shortest sea journey although they would have had to travel on land to yeah, have, to no, have got I, there. I, I know I mean quite, quite why, what the reasoning was I, I don't know but I mean um, for, for doing that it, it was, had presumably been arranged between the two sides, because clearly they needed a clearance from the French for the London to go into um, a French port. But um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, who knows really? I mean, uh, whether um, Charles fancies an excursion down to Portsmouth as well to see, you know, the, the dockyard there, he's always, always keen to do that kind of thing. Well, being being in Portsmouth myself today and being based in Portsmouth and travelling down the seafront, nice to have that little connection to being grounded on the horse seabat sandbag, even if only for a little while. Yes, yeah, <laughs> right. I think that was a, a bit of an embarrassment, especially when you've actually got the king watching, as he almost certainly would have been, you know, waving goodbye to his sister and his mother, and uh, then the ship goes aground. I mean, I don't think that was the, the London's finest hour particularly. Uh, no, <laughs> um, I, I, I've often wondered about how how many people in terms of an actual name we know of as being on the ship when it explodes. Just the we one. Do, we don't. None. I mean, None. The, the, the problem is that 
by definition, I would have thought a lot of the paperwork relating to the ship would have been destroyed on it. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, it, it, it's simply a, a fact of the archives as they are now. We've got hardly any pay books or muster books that would give us that kind of information before about 1673. It, it, it just doesn't exist for any ship, let alone the London. Um, and you get the odd chance survival. I mean, the ship lists that I was showing, for example, um, there's a complete run of that kind of thing from 1673, but there are these few odd isolated survivals from earlier that prove that that kind of list, that monthly list, was done all the way along. It's just that the ones we have only begin in 73. Yeah. We have... Um uh steve ellis and the team from the london shipwreck trust last year um with funding as supplied by the campaign and generously from donations uh recovered and it's in conservation a little quarter size globe bottle which has a little icon of a dog motif on it and the initials ha yeah. and which sort of my my understanding is that the likelihood is that the ha potentially is the owner not the manufacturer uh, of it so trying to yeah. see who who is ha trying to find out uh to, to have to have owned a bottle yeah, to have owned yeah. The, you know the beautiful bottle that it is and have have the initials on it is somebody yeah you know, is going to be in history somewhere yeah well yeah absolutely but uh, sadly as i say there's very little evidence like that Yes, we may not know. Uh, we've got something from Duncan Ross about any newspapers from that time. Okay, um, again, newspapers as we understand them really start in the same year, 65, a little bit later, when what becomes the London Gazette is launched. Um, but that is very much an official um, sheet for, for the government. It's carrying the government's line on things and so forth. Um, there aren't newspapers as we understand them. And one of the reasons for this is that during the Civil War, it had been open season. You had all sorts of things claiming to be newspapers and all sorts of crude broadsheets and woodcuts and so on and so forth. Um, but I mean, you know, they go on these, these days about fake news, absolutely as nothing to the fake news that's out there in the Civil War. And so when the monarchy comes back in 1660, um, there's a reimposition of censorship, not terribly effectively in, in effect. But then, as I say, you do get this um, London Gazette coming in, in in 1665. And it's just as well it does, because, of course, it provides then a very good source for things like the plague and the Great Fire and so forth, but not, unfortunately, for um you know the existence of the london i suppose it shouldn't be a surprise that if the london gazette is the official government publication that to it's this used day. <laughs> yeah, to yeah, this yeah. Day, yeah. <laughs> uh uh then i don't know whether you're the right person to ask this question to or whether somebody else later on uh in the in the day but in terms of the the level of inquiry that takes place into the reasoning for the the loss into the reasoning for the explosion um you know there is there are no court martials there are no inquiries official inquiries as to why it took place to try to prevent it from you know or even guidance that comes out to prevent it happening again yeah well it, it, exactly and i think there's several reasons potentially for that when ships um blow up and this sort of thing yeah you would normally have a court martial but again the records tend to start in 1673. Yeah. Now, I suspect as well with London, there simply wouldn't have been any anybody to court martial um, in the sense of the people who might have known, because clearly Lawson wasn't on the ship. Um, you know, he, had, he hadn't gone aboard yet. Um, and so, I, as I say, I don't think they, uh, they do take it very far. And of course, the other factor we need to remember is that March 1665, everybody's principal focus is on the war yeah which which is just beginning um and the fitting out of the fleet is the priority so they don't really want any distractions um from that at that particular point even if there had been 
evidence to go on. Um, and I know it sounds slightly callous, but this was an occupational hazard with wooden ships. <laughs> they, they do go on fire, they do blow up. Yeah. And there are so many instances of this throughout the, the 17th century. Uh, yes, and, and that there's got coffee house gossip about the, the quality of the gunpowder, but I think we'll leave that to Ruth's presentation next. Absolutely. It may well be covered in that. Absolutely. But um, uh, Liz has asked a question, which I know you covered in your presentation last year to us. Uh, was it common to name ships after places? No, um, it, it wasn't. It, it, it was very, very new one. I mean, I did suggest last year that the London was possibly the first occasion when a big warship had been named after a place. And I think that in itself tells you something about the importance of the city of London to the Commonwealth regime, to Cromwell, um, you know, that it's acknowledging this relationship. It becomes much more common subsequently, but certainly the London is one of the first, if not the first to be named after a place. Because you had ships named after battles and successes, uh, but less common. Well, and obviously when both before and after the Restoration, before the Civil War, I should say, and after the Restoration, um, named after members of the royal family. Yeah. Um, Charles II is incredibly immodest with, with this. You know, he just keeps naming ships after himself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love that. Uh, we've got time for one more question, so we'll ask Janice uh, asks, and it refers back to your reference to the um, court martial records. Uh, why did the record start in 1673? Two theories. Well, there's probably more than two theories, but my two theories, uh, sounding a bit like that, that old Monty Python sketch. Um, one is that there's a big fire in the Navy office in 1673, and you know, again, occupational hazards. I mean, like, for example, the Palace of Whitehall goes up in 1698. Um, and again, a lot of naval records are going to be destroyed there. So it's quite possible that a lot of the pre-73 records are destroyed in the Navy office fire. Yeah. Second possible reason, um, not necessarily unconnected to that, is that in 1673, Pepys becomes the Secretary of the Admiralty, um, and, you know, that does certainly in terms of the Admiralty's record keeping, he clearly makes changes and a lot more is then retained and classified. And in many cases, the classifications that he used are still the ones that the National Archives um, uses to this day. Brilliant. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to have you join us again for the second time. Maybe we'll see you in 2022 uh, in March face to face, we hope, of course.